labor, suffering, pain, slavery. From ancient times to colonial America, slavery has been a major part of American society, at least up until the Civil War took place. Since the very beginning of American colonization, slavery was quintessential to the survival of the colonists. Due to the high demand for cash crops, slaves became more and more popular throughout the history of the country and eventually played a major role in the economy. Slaves sold for high prices but easily worked off their costs over time. Slaves can be seen as one of the only reasons as to why America was able to become so successful. Jamestown is seen as the first self-sufficient British colony, and this is greatly due to the cash crops that they produced. The reliance of crops to make money soon led to an influx of slaves that were necessary to cultivate the land. Virginia was the first colony to establish slavery in 1661, and was soon followed by Maryland and the Carolinas. At this time in history, the North also used slavery, albeit in smaller numbers. There weren't many small farms that had slaves because they were expensive. This meant that most slaves were found in extremely large plantations. While the slaves were expensive, they allowed for work to be done much quicker and eventually paid off in the long run. The conditions that slaves lived under were reliant on their owners. It was possible for slaves to be treated kindly and to be given proper amounts of nourishment, making slavery easier. I'll give you food. It's <laughs> also possible for the slaves to live a life of abuse and hardships where they were whipped constantly and punished at every mistake. Slavery would go on to exist in America all the way up to 1865 and it would only become an, a large issue in the early 1800s. As the United States grew, the importation of slaves skyrocketed and developments hey, like the cotton gin created a greater desire for slaves. Hey, the quality of life for slaves varied greatly but on large plantations, the treatment was typically very hard. <laughs> At this point, the North began to see the inhumanity that surged through the mistreatment of the black. You know, I think that people have this misconception that the fight against slavery was all about the cruelty that owners brought to their slaves. But in reality, that's not 100% the case. The North saw slavery as an almost unfair advantage for the South. I mean, if you just look at the Three-Fifths Compromise back in 1787, the bill allowed three-fifths of the slave population in slave states to count as part of the population for more representation in Congress. The North would obviously be upset about this. Plus, you also have the economic interests with the agriculture and cat crop business down there. So there are really many reasons that the North felt at a somewhat disadvantage, and the issue of brutality never really came up into American minds until individuals started to speak up, and this abolitionist movement really came into fruition. The South looked past this inhumanity as it brought them great prosperity through their selling of tobacco, cotton, and other raw materials, while the North had already begun abolishing slavery through the late 1700s and early 1800s. As years passed in the 1800s, America became less tolerant and accepting of enslavement. People began to rise to the occasion. People like Frederick Douglass, William Lloyd Garrison, and David Walker. William Lloyd Garrison was really very essential to this movement. His ambitions led to his own slavery-based abolitionist paper called The Liberator. Through this, he spread radical views, as they were considered at the time. He argued that free and slave states should remain separate and was also against the annexation of Texas, as well as the Mexican-American War. So, he was very much interested in staying where the country was to avoid major conflicts, but wanted to make changes within our system rather than expanding and simply spreading these issues farther. But Garrison wasn't the only one. David Walker was also a very influential piece of our history. He was yet again another outspoken abolitionist. However, unlike many others who were for a gradual phasing out of slavery, Walker declared for the immediate release and freedom of slaves. Walker's father was a slave and his mother was free, and therefore free. This, I think, is a major reason for his profound ideas. He felt that every African American had the right to be a full and equal citizen of the United States and really overall changed the outlook on the whole movement. 
One of the most significant groups within America before and after the Civil War was the American Anti-Slavery Society. The society was actually created by two men, William Lloyd Garrison and Arthur Tapan. It had around 250,000 members, with 1,350 local charters as well. Within the 250,000 members, there were multiple famous names, including the likes of Frederick Douglass. The society did all kinds of things in order to achieve its goals, one of the most important being its weekly newspaper, the National Anti-Slavery Standard. Another interesting fact was that many would not even consider was that the newspaper actually wasn't just focused only on the suffrage of black men, but also covered the topic of women's suffrage. Having strong views over such a big topic at the time was bound to bring controversy, in which it certainly did. It wasn't only the anti-slavery society that received this flag, but nearly everyone who held a strong position over slavery would receive some type of heat eventually. Perhaps one of the most controversial books over slavery at all would actually be a book by the name of David Walker's Appeal, which contained very radical anti-slavery ideas at the time. During the time period in which all of this controversy over slavery occurred, getting to the public was a much harder means than just pulling out a phone and making a tweet. Perhaps the best way at the time to get, the, to, get to the general public was through newspapers. Along with the American Anti-Slavery Society's National Anti-Slavery Standard, there were also two other very significant anti-slavery newspapers as well. This included the Liberator, which was actually founded by one of the eventual founders of the American Anti-Slavery Society, as well as the North Star, created by the one and only Frederick Douglass. The Liberator was created before the American Anti-Slavery Society was even founded. That also known as the Southampton Insurrection, Nat Turner's Rebellion was the most brutal and perhaps most famous slave rebellion in America during the 1800s. The uprising occurred in Southampton County, Virginia, in August of 1831. Led by Nat Turner, slaves went out in violent retaliation. The rebellion ended up killing over 50 people and was eventually put down at Belmont Plantation, but casualties weren't the only result of this rebellion. The rebellion actually ended up instilling widespread fear. The execution of over 50 slaves thought to have taken a role in the rebellion eventually happened, and many other slaves who weren't even involved faced punishment. Yet, this wasn't the end. A couple hundred African Americans were murdered around the area as well. Some states in the South also began to prohibit the education of free and slave blacks in an attempt to keep them from being able to make significant communications with each other. The South was doing almost everything it could in order to prevent another Nat Turner's rebellion. Blessed in me, I hereby sentence you to be hung by the neck until death. Frederick Douglass was an ideal figure in the fight against slavery. He was certainly one of the most important abolitionists and embodied many traits that a strong leader would normally have. Typical things like a powerful voice and being able to give emotional and striking speeches really helped him in becoming a key figure in the abolitionist movement during the mid to late 1800s. Who, so stolid and selfish that would not give his voice to swell from the nation's jubilee when the chains of servitude had been torn from his limbs. Douglas was not only one of the most influential figures of his time, but he was also doing all of his work as a black man. The fact he was able to sustain such a high reputation and gather the following he had is completely admirable. The tension between the North and the South was centered around the issue of slavery. The South heavily relied on the usage of slaves to sustain their economy and effectively run their plantations, which provided most of their economy. The North was beginning to use less slaves as they were gearing towards a more industrialized economy that required less physically demanding work and was based on taking raw materials and turning them into finished products. 
The issue over slavery was one that would obviously be a problem, but no one wanted to face it simply because the economic benefits of slavery couldn't be denied. And with half of the country relying on it greatly, it wouldn't be in the best interest of the still young union to simply emancipate all slaves. When the U.S. started gaining land in the West, the controversy over slavery once again came up in the form of which new states would be slave states and which would be free. This was solved in the Missouri Compromise in 1820. This would decide that states above the parallel 3630 line would be free states and below it would be slave states. This was a major, major decision and problem as it would affect the balance of power in government when it came to laws that concerned slavery. This meant that it was necessary to keep an equal balance between the amount of slave states and free states. This would only create more tension than the tariff of abominations was passed in 1828, which rose the prices of imports highly and forced the South to now rely heavily on the goods that the North produced. This is written awfully. Like, just, just the actual crap. Like, it's so bad, it's not. When Andrew Jackson became president and the common man was given more importance, the issue of the rights of the common man, especially over suffrage, came to fruition and inadvertently led to the rights of slaves. The question became whether or not slaves should be given rights and be emancipated, something the South was completely against. When the election of 1860 in the South lost, it appeared to be the last straw and the already fed up states would act. When Lincoln was elected, South Carolina immediately acted and called for a convention that would create a confederacy. In just three months after the new president was elected, seven states had already seceded and the Jefferson Davis had been elected as the president of the Confederate States of America. The North made a last ditch attempt to draw the South back in by proposing to extend the 3630 line all the way to the Pacific Ocean, but the consequences had been too severe and the war was soon to start. The Battle of Rich Mountain was fought on July 11, 1861. On this day, General George B. McClellan led the Union troops to score another major victory in the struggle to obtain Western Virginia at the Battle of Rich Mountain. The North secured the region and ensured the later creation of Western Virginia. Western Virginia was a very important battleground in the early stages of the war. The population was divided over the issue of becoming a part of the Union or seceding and joining the Confederates. Western Virginia was a very important east-west link for the North because the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad ran through its own mountains. General McClellan won several small victories within the Western Virginia in June as well as early July. He's in love the generals of the Confederate side were General Robert Garnett and Colonel John Pigram. They positioned their infantry at Rich Mound and Laurel Hill in an attempt to block off two major roads and keep General McClellan from entering any further east. However, McClellan created a plan to pretend to be hurt from an attack against Garnett at Laurel Hill, while he sent the majority of his force against Pigram at Rich Mound. Nice. General William Rosecrans led part of McClellan's force to follow a rugged mountain path to go around behind the rebels' left flank. After a difficult march through the pouring rain, General Rosecrans attacked the Confederate wing. Although it took several attempts, he was finally able to drive the Confederates away from their position. With no hint of mercy, McClellan fired at the rebels but did not make the expected attack. The Union and the Confederates each suffered around 70 casualties. General Pegram was forced to leave his position, but Rosecrans blocked his escape route. Two days later, Pegram surrendered his force of 555 casualties. Although McClellan became known as a Union hero as a result of this victory, most historians would agree that General Rosecrans deserved the credit. McClellan was on his way to becoming the commander of the Army of the Potomac. Roughly two years later, after many major battles, we reach to a certain point within the Civil War where this particular battle is considered to be one of the most important and critical battles, the Battle of Gettysburg. This battle was fought from July 1st to July 3rd, 1863. This battle was the most important battle of the Civil War. Robert E. Lee marched his army of Northern Virginia into Pennsylvania. After being forced down in troops by a massive artillery bombardment in the afternoon, Lee went and attacked the center of the Union Army Cemetery Ridge and was greeted in what is now known as Pickett's Charge. Lee's second invasion of the North had failed, which led to a loss in casualties. In late June of 1863, the Union won the battle. The Union lost 23,000 men. The Confederates lost 28,000 men. 
the hopes for the South of foreign recognition of the Confederacy were gone. The Battle of Antietam was fought on September 17, 1862, near Antietam Creek in Sharpsburg, Maryland. The generals that fought in the war was George McClellan of the Union and General Robert E. Lee of the Confederates. This was the first battle of the American Civil War to be fought on Northern territory. Although McClellan had a lower amount of casualties to destroy Lee's army, he was able to check the Confederate advance into the North. After countless Union defeats, the victory provided President Abraham Lincoln the political cover he needed to issue the Emancipation Proclamation. Although the result of the battle was not determined, it remains as the bloodiest day in American history, with more than 22,000 casualties in total from both the Confederates and the Union. General Robert E. Lee advanced into Maryland, believing that the potential strategic and political gains justified his opposition of the Confederate defensive policy. Lee's complex plan divided his forces, and disaster struck when a lost copy of that plan came to the hand of Union Commander Major General George B. McClellan. However, McClellan wasted the advantages of the discovery in his numbered troops. Lee selected a battleground that was suited for defense, but was dangerous because the Potomac River was behind him. The first few hours of fighting came across farmer David Miller's 30-acre cornfield, were, uh, were unconcludable. Next, the series of attacks against Lee's center overran the area afterward called the Bloody Lane. The last action was commanded by the Union. The Union decided to attack Lee's right flank, but was stopped by the Confederate reinforcements. Lee retreated across the river on September 18, losing 10,318 casualties of 38,000 to McClellan's 12,401 of 75,000. That on the first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1,863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then, thenceforward, and forever free. Abraham Lincoln gave one of the most famous speeches in American history on September 22nd, one month after the Union's victory at the Battle of Antietam. Early on in the war, Lincoln realized that recruiting freed and escaped slaves from the Confederate States would be an effective military strategy. In an attempt to further the amount of soldiers in the Union Army, he issued the proclamation with hopes that many of the freed slaves would retreat to the North and help them fight. Lincoln had always been against slavery personally, but when he became president, he knew that he had to put his hatred aside to please Southerners and preserve the Union. When the tactic failed and the Civil War broke out, Lincoln had switched sides and made the war entirely about the issue of slavery. Slaves were so essential to the Confederate war efforts that when they were taken away, the Union had a great shot at victory. Although Lincoln had issued the Emancipation Proclamation and declared all slaves free, it didn't hold any ground. He knew that the proclamation would have to have constitutional validity in order for the law to be enforced everywhere in the United States. Thus, Lincoln and his Republican Party set forth a bill for an amendment to the Constitution that would abolish slavery. Who votes that we ratify the 13th Amendment? I. I. Nay. I. Well, gentlemen, looks like we've reached a decision. The amendment states, neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime whereof the party shall have been duly convicted, shall exist within the United States, or any place subject to their jurisdiction. Congress shall have power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. The Republican Senate quickly gained the two-thirds vote to pass it. Months later, the Democrats would have a two-thirds vote to pass it, and a year later, on December 18, 1865, three-quarters of all states will have ratified the 13th Amendment. On April 9, 1865, the first Confederate surrender occurred following the Union victory at Appomattox Courthouse. In an attempt to retreat from Union soldiers, General Robert E. Lee's Confederate army became surrounded by Union troops. General Lee had almost 40,000 men left with him when he left the Appomattox Courthouse, but about a month later, his army was reduced to just 28,000 men due to the Union army. Defeated, Lee would admit to surrender and request a meeting with General Ulysses S. Grant to discuss the terms of surrender. The two generals met at the house of one Wilmer McLean. General Grant showed up in his field uniform, which was muddy and dirty, while Lee wore his general's uniform with sash and sword. It was a relatively short meeting. Lee arrived and quickly asked for terms of surrender, and that was it. Lee ended it, and for the most part, the war was over. 
Grant wrote down the terms of surrender which said that all men who participated in the war were pardoned and were to be sent home with their personal property, their horses, and generals were allowed to keep their firearms. Additionally, Grant was generous enough to give Lee and his men, who were starving and hadn't eaten in days, the rest of their rations. Oh. Although Lee surrendered his men and the war was basically over, other Confederate troops and armies refused to give up. Just six hours after Lee surrendered to Grant, the Confederates fought at Spanish Fort in Alabama and lost, and soon went on to battle at Fort Blakely and lost there too. Here, General St. John Richardson Liddell lost 4,000 men after being forced to surrender. On April 26, General Joseph E. Johnston surrendered his 100,000 troops to William T. Sherman in Raleigh, North California. Johnston's terms of surrender only authorized the surrender of his troops, but Sherman provided the same terms of surrender as General Lee had previously received, which included giving the Confederates their personal rights back. The final act of violence of the Civil War occurred on November 6, 1865, by Captain James Waddell and his ship, the CSS Shenandoah. Before hearing word of Lee's surrender, Captain Waddell continued to capture Union ships and fishermen slash whalers up until the beginning of August. After finally seeing land, Waddell took port in England and surrendered his ship to the Royal Navy. Although the Confederates surrendered and the fighting stopped, the war was technically still going on, only up until Andrew Johnson actually declared the war over a, a whole year later on August 20th, 1866. The Civil War finally came to a close when President Andrew Johnson issued Proclamation 157, declaring that peace, order, tranquility, and civil authority now exist in and throughout the whole of the United States of America.